As mentioned in my earlier videos about software design, I make a distinction between functional software design and structural software design. In this video, we will be taking a closer look at what I mean by structural software design. As I see it, the core elements of structural software design are 1. The decomposition of the code base into smaller components and 2. The interfaces of these smaller components and 3. The control flow between these components. Decomposing a code base into smaller components is a common practice in software design. The decomposition helps achieve benefits such as reuse of components, easier implementation due to narrower responsibilities of the components, and the ability to have more developers work on the code base without the developers having to work on the same components. Exactly how you split the code base up depends on the design philosophy you are using. I will not get into the various different design philosophies in this video though, but I will get back into design philosophies in future videos. The interfaces between components, meaning the interfaces of each component, have a direct impact on how easy the components are to reuse and how easy they are to compose into larger structures able to solve specific problems. Two of the main factors to design for are reusability and ease of use. Exactly how you design the interfaces of the components depends on the design philosophy you are using and the responsibility of the component. So I won't get into too much detail about that here either, but I will get back into that in future videos too. The last element of structural software design, as I see it, is the control flow between the components. Even though there are not an infinite amount of ways in which control can flow between your components, you will still often have at least a couple of different options. If you look at the example here in this diagram, we have a component A and a component B. And you could decide to either have component A called component B, or you could have component B called component A. Or you could decide to add a third component C, which first calls A and then calls B. This may sound a little bit hypothetical, so let's have a look at a more concrete example. Imagine that component A here is capable of loading a file and component B here is capable of processing a file. For instance, calculating a hash value or whatever, something like that from the file. Then one way to design this interaction would be to create an instance of A and then call a.load, so calling the load method on A, passing a path to the file to load, and then a new B, meaning a new data processor. A will then load the file and pass the bytes onto this B instance here, and B will then return the result of the processing, which A will then return to whoever calls A. But another way to design the exact same functionality would be to have A, B, uh, A, B an, up, an abstract data source and B still be a data processor. And then you would create an instance of the data processor, call its process method here and pass a new instance of a data source to process. B will then call the data source and get it to load the data and then it will process the data and return the result. So as you can see, in both cases we get the exact same result out of this interaction here, but the control flow is different. The direction of the control flow is opposite in both of these examples. And third, we could decide to add a third component C and then the interaction would look like this. We would have an instance of C, we would call its process method here and C would be a data processing coordinator and so what it will do is it will take an instance of A and an instance of B, an instance of a data source and an instance of a data processor. What C will do is it will first 
load or call uh, the data source which loads the file and then it will call the data processor which processes the file and the result of the processing will then be returned from C to whoever calls C. Now as you can see this is a quite simple uh, example but it is quite possible to distribute the responsibility of the components in such a way to achieve that you achieve a control flow going from A to B or from B to A or from C to A and then to B. As you might have figured out by now how you decide to design the control flow between the components of your application also has an impact on how you decompose the code base into components and also an impact on the interfaces of these components. In the first case here, A's interface needs to know about the existence of B, but B probably doesn't need to know about A. You know, B could probably just be given an array of bytes, process it and return a result, which is also an array of bytes. In the second case, however, B needs to know about A, but A probably does not need to know about B because A can just load the file and return the bytes and B can do whatever it wants with the bytes and then return that as a result. And as in the third case here, you can see A does not need to know about B and B does not need to know about A either. It is C that needs to know about both A and B. So the interface of C needs to know about both A and B. And this is just a different way of structuring the control flow and splitting the responsibility between the components of your application. But as you can see, the control flow impacts both the decomposition and the interfaces of each component. So which of these three designs should you choose? Well, that is up to you to decide. In a near future, I will be releasing a video about compositional design in which I will give you three simple principles that you can use to guide your structural design. And if you follow these three principles, you will automatically arrive at one of these designs. But I will not tell you now which of them it is because then I would have to explain the rules and everything, the principles, and I will uh, wait but getting into detail about that until that video about compositional design. For now, all I want to say is that how depends on why. In other words, how your structural design should look depends on what you are trying to achieve with the design. The why is typically deducted from your overall software design goals, but may also depend on the design philosophies or techniques you are using. I covered software design goals in general in my previous video in this software design playlist. And if you check out the description below this video, you can find a link to that video. So to sum it all up, as I see it, there are three core elements to structural design. The first element is the decomposition of your code base into components. The second element is the interfaces of these components and the third element is the control flow between these components. Additionally, how depends on why, meaning how you design your code, meaning how you decompose, how you design the interfaces and how you design the control flow depends on what you are trying to do what you're trying to achieve with the design as well as the design philosophies that you're using and the techniques that you're trying to use and some of the more well-known design philosophies or principles are solid hexagonal architecture dependency injection inversion control inversion of control design patterns domain driven design and my own compositional design here and I won't get into more detail about any of these philosophies. All I will say is that each of these philosophies has something to say about how you would decompose, how you would design the interfaces and how you would design the control flow. 
That is all for this video about structural software design. Remember to check out the description below this video for links to related videos, tutorials and my playlist about software design. And if you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel.